Hello, family and friends. Day 243 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. If you are new to this Bible study, welcome. We are so happy that you're here. This community continues to grow every single day. So just know that you are right on time. You are not behind. Just know that God needs you right where you're at. He doesn't want our agenda, but he wants our heart. And the fact that you have shown up today just goes to show that your heart is postured toward him. And that is to be commended. So so thank you for being here. If you have been here for a while and if you love to read the Word of God, if you could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up if this Bible study has helped you in your journey to read the Word. Also make sure that you're subscribed, hit the notification bell, and join us in our Facebook group as that group continues to evolve as we continue to have conversations even after the Bible study is finished here on YouTube. So we thank you, Lord, so much for this day. It's a new day, God, and we will continue Continue to rejoice because you have allowed us to wake up today to have breath in our lungs to be able to praise you you have saved us Lord you have restored us forgiven us changed from glory to glory and we are so so grateful for that today may we never take it for granted father for what you have done for us by sending your son Jesus please forgive us for our sins because that was the whole purpose by sending him Lord is so that his blood could cover our sins that could be the final atonement Lord so that we would be able to have eternal life with you. And so I just thank you for that, Jesus, for what you have done. And I just pray that you will also help us to forgive others, Lord, who have hurt us and sinned against us. As we read today your word, I pray, God, that you will again meet us where we are. We have come to you faithfully day after day, expectant, Lord, that you are going to do a mighty work within us. Even if it starts off small, we will not despise the small beginning and the seeds that you begin to plant within us. And we will not despise Despise the seeds then that you call us to plant into others. So we thank you for that, Lord. We believe that everything that you do, as long as we have our hearts turned toward you, is always for our good. So thank you for turning everything for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We give it all back to you, Lord, as a pleasing sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we start off here in chapter 16, where Israel or Jerusalem is being described in a metaphorical sense as a faithless bride, as a bride who has cheated on her husband. Now, I do want to give you a bit of a warning here that if this is read into a little too deeply, you could go down rabbit holes and go wayward. <laughs> so try to stay focused and stay on track with what God is speaking at the surface level. We don't want to be surfacey in our reading of the word, but sometimes we could easily be led astray if we try to read too much into the word of God. And so I'm gonna do my best, Lord. I pray that you will keep us focused, keep our eyes exactly where you want them pointed. And I pray, God, that these will not be my words, but yours. May I not miss anything, Lord. And will you please minister to our hearts right now in Jesus' name, amen. So we start off again, the word of the Lord came to me. So again, this is Ezekiel speaking, and he says to him, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. Now stopping here on Jerusalem, even though that is the capital city of Judah, this is speaking to Israel as a whole. You know, Jerusalem actually didn't become the capital until King David. So we're talking to Israel here and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. So remember the promised land was in the land of Canaan. So he's saying your mother and father were the people who lived there before. And as for your birth, on the day that you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out in the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. So if you think about a, an abandoned newborn, God is basically saying, this is what you were when I found you. And when it says rubbed with salt, what does this mean? Well, in this day, newborns were typically rubbed with salt in order to disinfect and cleanse them in the beginning. And Jerusalem, again, was like a newborn baby, an abandoned baby. 
and God alone gave her glory. So this is the beginnings, their humble beginnings, small beginnings, poor beginnings. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. This was always the purpose of God and his heart toward Israel was so that she could live. And that's the same for us. He never wants us to die. He doesn't uh, get excited about any of his children dying. Of course, he always says that none should perish, all should come to repentance. And that was the very case with Israel as well. So live, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. So under God's care, Israel did become larger and stronger and more mature, specifically under the reign of David and Solomon. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. So this is where we have to have really mature minds. This is speaking about her maturity, where her breasts did form into their completion. And also this specifically speaking about pubic hair being grown. So she has fully matured here at this point. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God. And you became mine. So if we think about this, because this could seem a little bit creepy. Remember when I told you, be careful about going down the rabbit hole? It's in cases like this, like, oh, this seems really weird that God is referring to his people this way. But if you really look at it for what it is, marriage is the highest form of love and commitment on this earth. So that is what he is trying to describe here, that his commitment to them is that highest form of commitment that we could possibly know on this side of heaven. Uh, then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, and you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. So this is showing its completion and the fact that it is finished. When God entered into that covenant, he is saying it is done. And this is also looking toward that new covenant that we have with Jesus. When Jesus died on that cross, cross. He said, it is finished. And so if we look at these things that I underlined here, these are the same things that Jesus does for us when we enter into that covenant. He covers our nakedness or our shame. He enters into that new covenant with us that we will now have eternal life. He bathes us with water. He washes us clean by his blood, takes away all of our blood and our iniquities. He anoints us. He clothes us with robes of righteousness. He wraps us in his love and in the finest of linens. He gives us all of his goodness, compassion, and kindness, and grace. He adorns us. He uh, feeds us and nourishes us, and we do grow exceedingly beautiful when we enter into that relationship with him. Our spirits become more beautiful, but he looks at us that way. He calls us beautiful, and he seats us in a higher place, so he does advance us to that royalty. And in his eyes, we are perfected through Jesus. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. So basically, because of all of this stuff they were given, they were like a spoiled child where they trusted more in the things and loved the things more than they loved God. And they thought that their prosperity meant that God was approving of their lifestyle. And so they became really apathetic and were like, oh, well, this must mean God's okay with what we're doing. Doing. So basically, they turned the gifts that God had given them into idols. Your beauty became his. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines, and on them played the whore. The like has never been, nor ever shall be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself images of men 
and with them played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them, and set my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey, and you set before them a pleasing aroma, and so it was, declares the Lord God. And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth, basically when he rescued them and when he did a mighty work in their lives, when you were naked and bare, wallowing in your blood. So these are all of the things here that they are guilty of. They built shrines, they created idols, they gave to them what belonged to God. So they were sacrificing to their gods at this point and they were practicing human sacrifice. And of course, one of the biggest things is that they did not remember what God had done in the past for them. And after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square. So not only did you do all of this wickedness, but you even continued in it and continued to do more and more wickedness. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger. So these were, uh, this was another thing they did was seeking those alliances with these other nations, which was completely against what God wanted for them. He wanted them to trust in him, but here they were instead trusting in their alliances with other people, including Egypt. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and I diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies. So he took away their land and put them into the hands of their captives, captors, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed or of your lewd behavior. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied because that is the case with idolatry. It's never satisfied. It always wants more. When we uh, live our lives according to the world, that is when we have that emptiness, that dissatisfaction with life. Yes, you played the whore with them and still you were not satisfied. You multiplied your whoring also with the trading land of Chaldea. And even with this, you were not satisfied. How sick is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place on every square. Yet you were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. So if you think about what prostitutes do, they sell themselves so that they can receive payment. That's like their job. But he's saying you all scorned the payment. In fact, adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband, men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you, you gave your gifts to all of your lovers. So he's saying you all, instead of getting paid for your services, you paid other people to be able to sin. That's kind of crazy to think about, right? So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore and you gave payment while no payment was given to you. Therefore, you were different and basically worse. Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your lust was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with your lovers and with all your abominable idols, and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them, therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure. So all of those nations, Egypt, Assyria, Chaldea, Babylon, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them. So he will shame Israel before their lovers or the other nations and that they may see all of your nakedness. And I will judge you as women who commit adultery and shed blood are judged. So remember that adultery in this day was subject to death. They would have been stoned to death. So they will experience judgment by way of death and bring upon you the blood of wrath and jealousy. And I will give you into their hands and they shall throw down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places. 
They shall strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare. So they will be shamed by their lover. But again, this is all for the purpose of their restoration. He had given them many, many, many chances and years to come to repentance and they weren't listening. So now this is his only option. They shall bring up a crowd against you and they shall stone you and cut you into pieces with their swords. And they shall burn your houses and execute judgments upon you in the sight of many women. I will make you stop playing the whore and you shall also give payment no more. So will I satisfy my wrath on you and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be calm and will no more be angry because you have not remembered the days of your youth, but have enraged me with all these things. Therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord God. Have you not committed lewdness in addition to all your abominations? Behold, everyone who uses Proverbs will use this proverb about you, like mother, like daughter. So basically, just like those who were committing evil in the land of Canaan, now the Israelites are going to be compared the same way to those people. You are the daughter of your mother who loathed her husband and her children, and you are the sister of your sisters. So this term here is kind of like Lord of Lords or King of Kings, meaning you are the worst of the worst. Who, oh, and by the way, her sisters being Samaria and Sodom. Samaria who was exiled, Sodom who was destroyed. Who loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. And your elder sister is Samaria who lived with her daughters to the north of you. And your younger sister who lived to the south of you is Sodom with her daughters. So pretty incredible that they are being compared to Sodom specifically because we know the destruction that Sodom and Gomorrah faced and he is saying you all are worse than Sodom not only did you walk in their ways and do according to their abominations within a very little time you were more corrupt than they in all your ways as I live declares the Lord God your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done behold this was the guilt of your sister Sodom she and her daughters had pride excess of food and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and needy so here most people when they think about the sin of sodom they just assume that it was because of homosexuality now of course that was rampant and that is one of the main sins that they committed but this right here that god says is why he actually destroyed them. It was because of their pride. It was because of their excess of food, or basically, if we've ever heard the term, fullness of bread. So they had everything that they ever wanted and leanness of soul. So they were basically self-reliant and they were sinfully independent. And also the fact that they had prosperous ease, that their worldly living became their God, basically. Their sports, their hobbies, whatever they were living in, their way of life. So this could be something that we need to be extra vigilant in and we could do a heart check with is, is recreation a God to you? Do you spend more time in your sports, your hobbies, uh, where you, you say, you know what, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to study. I don't have time to pray or I don't have time to do this stuff that you guys are doing because I've got X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G to do. So do you have the time for the Lord? And if not, what is it that is filling up the minutes in your day? And also they did not give aid to the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me. So that abomination includes their sexual perversion and homosexuality. So I'm not saying that that wasn't one of the reasons, but that wasn't the main cause. God states it right here that it started with pride. Remember, all sin begins with pride. So I removed them when I saw it. Samaria has not committed half your sins. You have committed more abominations than they and have made your sisters appear righteous by all the abominations that you have committed. Bear your disgrace, you also, for you have intervened on behalf of your sisters. Because of your sins in which you acted more abom abominably than they, they are more in the right than you. So be ashamed, you also, and bear your disgrace, for you have made your sisters appear righteous. I will restore their fortunes though. Wow. This, 
God's grace on display more than ever. That he is saying that he will restore the fortunes of both Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters. But then I will also restore your own fortunes in their midst, that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done, becoming a consolation to them. As for your sisters, Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state, and you and your daughters shall return to your former state. Was not your sister Sodom a byword in your mouth in the day of your pride, before your wickedness was uncovered? Now you have become an object of reproach for the daughters of Syria and all of those around her and for the daughters of the Philistines, those all around who despise you. You bear the penalty of your lewdness and your abominations, declares the Lord. So this is showing God's love extending beyond Israel. So, of course, we have this hope for restoration, but sadly, the people still have to go through exile first. They still have to face some hard times first before God can completely restore them. But now we end here in this chapter with the ultimate restoration. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant, yet, good yet, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish you, sorry, establish for you an everlasting covenant. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you take your sisters, both your elder and your younger, and I give them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame, when I atone for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord God. So God's faithfulness is being shown to the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants, and it did not hinge upon their faithfulness to the covenant. Clearly, they were unfaithful to it. So that is why he is declaring this ultimate restoration, because it is based upon the old covenants that he made, and he will not be made out to be a liar. So he made a promise, and he is therefore going to keep it. And so when he says, you will remember your ways and be ashamed, he's saying, you will eventually come humble before me. And this new covenant will indeed bring that atonement through Jesus. And here in chapter 17, we see this parable of two eagles and a vine. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, propound a riddle. So a riddle being some sort of puzzling statement, puzzling story that has more of a deeper meaning and speak a parable or an illustration that, you know, describes a spiritual truth to the house of Israel. Say, thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors, came to Lebanon. So this eagle being Babylon, who is sort of the punisher, and Lebanon is Canaan, with, of course, Jerusalem as the major city. So came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. This is a description of Jehoiakim the king. He is the top of the cedar. So they took him captive. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs, so these being Jehoiakim's sons, and carried it to a land of trade, being Babylon, and set it in a city of merchants. Then he took of the seed, so the seeds being members of the royal family, he took of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. So the fertile soil is ultimately where royalty will rule. He placed it beside abundant waters and he set it like a willow twig. This now being de a depiction of Zedekiah, who ultimately bends to Nebuchadnezzar. And it sprouted and became a low sp uh, spreading vine and its branches turned toward him and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out boughs. And there was another great eagle. Now this one is going to be Pharaoh or Egypt with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine or the ruler and the remnant of Judah bent its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted that he might water it. And it had been planted on good soil by abundant waters that it might produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Now this being a rhetorical question, the answer of that being no. 
Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither? It will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it from its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind or that hot wind strikes it? Wither away on the bed where it sprouted. And a lot of the time the east wind referring to Babylon who comes in and destroys it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Say now to the rebellious house, do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon, or the great eagle. So he's now describing what all that stuff meant. So we're kind of flipping the, uh, the reversing of the descriptions here. Came to Jerusalem, or Lebanon, and took her king and her princes, meaning Jehoiakim and his sons, and brought them to him to Babylon. And he took one of the royal offspring, being Zedekiah, and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath, the chief men of the land he had taken away. So this was from the first invasion, and this uh, invasion and those who had been taken away included Daniel, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep his covenant that it might stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt, that they might give him horses and a large army. Will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? As I live, declares the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant with him he broke in Babylon, he shall die. Now, Zedekiah is the one who broke the covenant that he made with Nebuchadnezzar. And even though this was an ungodly covenant that he made, God still expected him to keep his word to this oath. So Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war when mounds are cast up and siege walls built to cut off many lives. He despised the oath in breaking the covenant and behold, he gave his hand and did all these things and he shall not escape. So just like Zedekiah, God expects us also to keep our word and our oaths that we make with God and also with people. So we can't make an oath and then go looking for greener pastures and say, oh, you know what, actually, I'm going to go do this instead. That is an example of some of the things that we do as Christians. You know, we're always kind of looking for that greener pasture. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely it is my oath that he despised and my covenant that he broke. I will return it upon its head. I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken into my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him. There for the treachery he has committed against me. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword and the survivors shall be scattered to every wind. And you shall know that I am the Lord and I have spoken. Now, all of these things are fulfilled in 2 Kings 24, 2 Chronicles 36, and Jeremiah 37 and 52. These being the same description of this or different descriptions of the same event. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar, being Israel, and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on high and lofty mountain. Does this sound familiar? The fact that God is going to take from that uh, from that lofty top of the cedar, a royal heritage. He's going to take a little sprig out of there and he is going to plant it on a high and lofty mountain. This, of course, is speaking of Jesus coming from the line of David, the branch of David, and he will be placed on Calvary ultimately. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it, it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. Birds on every sort will nest and all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. So he does do that. He raises up the humble. He brings down the proud, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Why would he make the dry tree flourish? I didn't notice this, but just as I'm reading it, I'm like, wait a minute. Shouldn't it be a tree that has nourishment that flourishes, one that is being able to drink? Well, if we think about it, this is talking about a thirsty tree. Those who thirst for the living waters will never thirst again. So that is why we will flourish. When we drink from the living waters, we will thrive. So I love how this chapter ends with God's mercy and his grace and the hope of a savior of Jesus to come. And this is near fulfilled all obviously under Zerubbabel, but ultimate fulfillment being with Jesus. 
So we thank you so much, Lord, for another good couple of chapters where we were able to hear your voice, to see your grace, to see the hope and to grab onto it for the future. Lord, we know that that idolatry never satisfies. The world can never satisfy. And so I pray, Lord, that we will always be thirsty for you. We will hunger for more of you so that we will hunger less for the things of the world, so that we will keep our eyes focused and fixed on you and walk in your ways all the days of our life so that when we get home, Lord, you will be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And if we forget, Lord, the covenant, the way that the people of Israel did, will you bring us back home? Because you never forsake your covenant. You never forget. And so I just ask for forgiveness, Lord, where we may have wandered off a little bit, where we may have gone astray. But thank you for welcoming us back home and into that covenant love once again. God, your plan has always been to rescue your people, and you still do that today. So we are grateful for that. God, we feel the rescuing. Every single day that we wake up, we know that we have got a new chance on life, a new lease on life, whenever we are aware of your presence. And so, Lord, we just are so grateful for your love. It is such an amazing love. It is so vast, so wide, so deep. We can never truly understand the depth of it. But when we think about how much we love our loved ones, oh God, how much more do you love us? And we just praise you and honor you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.